The case was actually filled in 2011 by Australian Securities and Investment Commission SA on Fortescue Metal Group Limited with Andrew Forrest, who was the FMG Chairman and Chief Executive Officer at that time. Based on the case, where actually the action conducted of, uh, by FMG in year 2004 and 2005 under Pilbara Infrastructure Project, which was mining and iron ore export project in Western Australia. FMG and Mr. Forrest signed an agreement with three Chinese companies, and after signing the agreement, FMG released the official statement that to Australian Stock Exchange and to Australian media to fulfill the requirement of continuous disclosure of information under corporate aid and as per listing rules of ASA. In 2006, ASA stated that the company and the chairman have broken several provisions under company aid and stated that the agreement made with the Chinese firm was just on the paper. FMG was engaged in suspicious and misleading activities and therefore has broken law under Section 1041H of Action 7 as well as Section 52 of the Trade Practices Act 1974. ASIC demanded for clarification and presenting correct statement related with violence of Section 1041H as well as Section 6742 along with compensation order and penalty. ASIC lost their case on first trial in front of single judge and federal court but in 2006, ASIC appealed at a full federal court which finally found FMG and Mr. Forrest guilty for all the charges. Okay, uh, regarding the duty breach, <coughs> Mr. Forrest, CEO of FMG, was alleged that he violated Corporation Act 2001, Section 180 because he breached his duty as FMG CEO. Corporation Act 2001, Section 180 stated that a director or other officer of a corporation must exercise their powers and discharge their duties with a degree of care and diligence that a reasonable person would exercise, and also they need to make a business judgment in good faith for proper purpose. Forrest was alleged that he breached his duties because he authorized and approved FMG statement to the Australian Stock Exchange and resulting FMG exposed to monetary penalties. Regarding these statements, FMG was alleged that they did misleading and deceptive conduct under Corporation Act 2001, Section 1041H and Section 674 and Trade Practice of Trade Practice Act 1974 because they provided false statement to the public that the framework agreement with Chinese supplier were enforceable under law. Therefore, this statement could affect the investor decision regarding the investment in, in FMG. The first allegation that was made against FMG was the allegation that the company had breached Section 1041H of the Corporations Act um, about misleading and deceptive conduct. There were three tests that had to be completed by the judges in the full federal court to determine whether FMG um, indeed release misleading and deceptive statements to the public. The first test was to see whether the statements that they released were facts or expressions of opinions. The court agreed that the statements that they released were indeed statement of facts. The second test was to decide the nature of the statement uh, of the framework agreements between FMG and the Chinese entities whether the framework agreements was a binding contract or merely an agreement to agree. So um, the court made the decision that the framework agreements were actually in fact simply agreements to agree. Um, based on Master versus Cameron case precedent, wherein a contract, um, a contract without pricing and scheduling agreed between the two parties are not binding. The final task is for the court to ascertain whether um, the statements that were released by FMG were um, misleading and deceptive to the public. 
The court found FMG to have indeed released misleading and deceptive statements because their false statements have induced the investors to purchase their shares, wherein if they had released a more accurate statements of the nature of the framework agreements, then investors might not have purchased shares um, from FMG. Therefore, the court found FMG to have breached Section 1041H of the Corporations Act. The second case that was made by ASIC against FMG is, um, is the allegation that the company had breached Section 6742 of Corporations Act for breach of continuous disclosure <coughs> obligations. This section requires companies and corporations to correct any misleading statements that they have released to the public. In this case, FMG and its director, Forrest, have failed to do so. Meanwhile, there was evidence to show that Forrest was aware that the framework agreements did not in fact contain any pricing or scheduling that were agreed between the company and the Chinese entities, meaning, Forrest were for, meaning that Forrest was aware that the framework agreements were not binding, but he chose to release a statement that reflect otherwise. ASIC also put a case in regards of the previous mentioned breach of continuous disclosure, which is under the section 6742A, the accessorial liability towards Andrew Forrest. Forrest is li held liable against his involvement of the contravention of the continuous disclosure obligation toward Australian Stock Exchange. In his defense, Forrest seeks the seek the defense under the section 674 2b which mention that a person does not contravene subsection 2a if the person proved that they a took all steps that were reasonable in the circumstances to ensure that the listed disclosing entities complied with the obligations under section subsection 2 and b after doing so, believe on reasonable grounds that the listed disclosing entity was complying with its obligation under that subsection. However, the court found out that Andrew Forrest was unable to point out any procedure that he took to ensure that the framework agreement were in law binding agreement to the effect represented by the FMG. The second part of the ASIC accusation towards Andrew Forrest was under section 181, which is the Corporation Act, as he breached the duty of care and the diligence of the directors. In his defense, Forrest relied upon the section 182 to be known as the business judgment rule, as mentioned before by Vicky. However, the court also found that Andrew Forrest cannot rely on his defense because there are several points that he made. Firstly, that the absence of the evidence from the forest made it difficult for him to rely upon his testament. Secondly, a decision not to disclose the true effect of the framework agreement could not be described as the business judgment. Thirdly, a decision not to make an accurate disclosure of the term of the major contract could not also be accepted as failing within the business operation. And lastly, such a decision which would be regarded as non-compliance of the act should not be construed in a ground of defense. So at the last, the court decided that the directors are not compliant with the Corporation Act according to Section 180. So uh, the directors must not rely on information and advice given by the top management. Moreover, the agreements may be between made between the entities must be considered as a binding document if they have a legal terms and conditions and the entities must fulfill their responsibilities as per as the declaration made in the agreement and also the rules must be clearer and consider situations where verbal and written commitments can be made between two entities so thus that should be included in a form of a formal contract uh, with the recommendation, the court says the corporate must share correct and clear information with clients and with the public. Directors and the top management of the company must take special care while announcing any project related to information with the investors and with the media. Thank you.